Well, it's been about a month now, and uh, I think we should do some really, really good funk music for some new intro music instead of our stupid, stinking, old, no one cared about music. Hey, yo, Finny, you know the drill. Hit it! Sure, Roger. Chapter 6, Symbol in Brass I'm Michael Dale Can we please get the regular music on? For now, we'll just go with this though For a moment, Frank thought his brother must be joking Then he too put his face in the window pane. Beneath the room's furniture, he could see only gapping darkness This is crazy, Frank muttered That furniture can't just stand in midair if only we could see better, Joe said, flattening his nose against the glass in an effort to peer downward. Suddenly, Frank gave a warning, hiss, and yanked Joe into a crouched position. What's wrong? Frank pointed off behind the rear of the house. In the distance, a tiny light could be seen moving among the trees. The boy shrank back into the shadows of some shrubbery. As they waited, Joe's eyes fell on what looked like an old coin. It was lying on the ground in a patch of light outside the window. Joe reached out and pocketed it. Meanwhile, the oncoming beam was zigzagging slowly among the grounds. Minutes went by. A night breeze sighed eerily among the hemlocks and cypresses. Bit by bit, the light moved closer to the boys' hiding places. Frank strained his eyes in the darkness. Suddenly, his scalp prickled. Joe! He gasped. Do you see what I do? I sure do. Carried by a white road finger. But common sense told the boys that the figure must be human. This is our chance to lay that spook story to the rest of once and for all, Joe whispered. Joe glanced at his brother. You mean we rushed the ghost? Right. Uh, but not yet. Wait until I give the word. The white figure flitted by, pausing every so often in the midst of tall underbrush. For a time, it seemed to be approaching the house. Then the light moved off in the other direction. Frank put his mouth close to Joe's ear. Sneak up and take Mr. Spook by surprise now! Silent as shadows, the Hardys darted out from between the shrubbery. Moving with swift steps, the, they closed in toward the phantom figure. But Joe, overeager, caught his foot in a tangle of underbrush and thudded to the ground. The white road finger whirled around, evidently startled by the noise. The, fla the, fla the flashlight it was carrying raked the two boys, then winked out wa uh, rapidly. A instant later, the figure had slipped away into the darkness. Frank halted only long enough to make sure his brother was unhurt, then raced in pursuit. Joe scrambled to his feet. By now, the white-robed figure was nowhere to be seen. Then Joe suddenly glimpsed something pale among the trees. Was the spook trying to invade them by doubling back toward the house? Joe sprinted to intercept it. He saw the phantom figure passed through two trees. Instantly, the faint ringing of an alarm bell could be heard inside the mansion. Uh, there must be one of those other electric eye beam things between those trees, Joe realized. Floodlights blazed along the house, and the front door burst open. Three men dashed inside. The ghost, meanwhile, had veered to the left and was disappearing into the darkness again, this time toward the road, but away from Hardy's car. Joe halted, uncertain of what to do next. If he continued the pursuit, he would risk being cut off by the men from the house before he could get back to the convertible. For all I know, they may be the ones who blew up our boat, he said to himself. As the men came closer, Joe made a fast decision and darted off among the trees. A moment later, he was startled by a rustle of shrubbery close to him. 
A shadow of figure was running alongside him. You okay, Joe? Yes, but whoa, you don't give me a heart failure like that. The sound of a pursuit grew fainter, and presently the two boys reached sloping ground and headed toward the car. Both boys hopped into the convertible, and Frank keyed the starter, and the engine came along with a roar. Spinning the wheel, he sent the car zooming down the lane. Talk about fast getaways, Joe panted as they reached the hallway. Did you get a good look at those men from the house? Uh, not too good of a look, but I think one of them may have been no strength. As the brothers came to the kitchen door of the Hardy home, they heard a loud buzz from the basement. <gasps> the short wave radio signal! Frank exclaimed. He and Joe hurried downstairs and switched on the powerful set in which the Hardys used for secret communication. For Nate calling Brayport, come in please. The last words swelled to a strong volume as Joe turned tuned the receiver. Bayport to Frenton, Frank said. We read you loud and clear. Good. I had I hoped I'd catch you boys in. How did that tel telephone tip pan out? Frank inquired eagerly. It hasn't so far, Mr. Hardy reported. The one that didn't arrive until six this evening and its passengers are all wealthy people. But there's a fair amount of jewelry aboard, but as yet we haven't turned a single clue that might indicate the robbery was planned. Do you think the tip was phony? Uh, too early to tell yet, but the police have a de dragnet out and <sighs> they haven't spotted any likely suspects. Of course, it's possible the jewel thieves caught off of the job for some reason. Dad, is it also possible the gang wants you to be stimmied there in East Hampton while they prepare to pull a job off somewhere else? Frank pulled it out. That's what I'm afraid of, Mr. Fart Hardy agreed. Meanwhile, Sam and I can't do much. What's the big picture there in Bayport? We briefly told his father on the day's develops. developments. Mr. Hardy was stunned to hear about the bombing of the sleuth and the attack on Joe at the Fillmore's gemstone shop. Also, he was intrigued by the... Motor Vehicle Report. I'm sure I've heard that name. Adam Duro, but I can't place it, the detective said. Try checking my pr criminal file. After a hasty conference with his operative, Sam Radley, Mr. Addy, Hardy added, Son, the way things are popping up in Bearport, I think Sam had better fly back and help you boys with your investigation. Hold up on Jack Wayne. We sh he should be able to land Sam there by midnight. Okay, Dad. We'll meet Sam at the airport. After signing off, Frank and Joe hurried upstairs to their father's study. A thorough check of the file revealed no criminalist under the name of Adam Darrow. Dad must have been mistaken, Joe concluded. Mrs. Hardy and Aunt Richard were watching a movie on television when the boys joined them. I suppose you boys would like a snack, they and my aunt said after the program ended. <laughs> Wouldn't object. Frank replied with a grin. As Miss Hardy went out to the kitchen, Joe suddenly remembered the coin he had picked up in the manager's window. As he examined it, the, the young sleuth gave a cry of amazement. <gasps> Frank, take a look at this! The coin appeared to be a brass piece. On both sides, it bore the design of a dragon. Well, the same design that Chet saw in the town square, Frank exclaimed. The boys began to discuss the new quail excitingly. Miss Hardy also looked at the lucky piece and pointed out the design of a violet above the dragon's head. Soon after, she returned to the living room, carrying a tray of sandwiches, cookies, and milk. She too had become cursed and asked to see the brass coin. Why, this belonged to old Jerome Perth, she announced triumphantly. How do you know? From the design, that's how, Aunt Gucci retorted. It, it, was a, it was his personal trademark. Auntie, you're wonderful. Frank exclaimed, that swindling old Rupert used to hand out these pieces right and left. She went on, especially when the, anyone asked him to contribute to charity, he used to say that these would bring the old luck, which is more important than money. Miss Hardy sniffed, <laughs> that dragon was appropriate. Well, then, since this is the design Chet described, the one he saw on the tiled surface, we know that he did not imagine it. Joe said to Frank, uh, we still don't know how it's its purpose. Frank put an eye out. Miss Hardy and Aunt Gertrude were keenly interested when they heard Chet's experience, and Miss Hardy puckered her brow thoughtfully. Uh, hey, Groot, wasn't there some, uh, summer house near the Perth mansion? She said, I believe there was, Laura. Seems to me a fellow that lived in the glove den was torn down. Why? I 
was wondering if that tiled surface might have been the floor of the summer house. Joe snapped his finger excitedly. I bet you've hit it, Mother! he exclaimed. Frank nodded in agreement. But if it, in that case, why couldn't we find it in this morning? he mused. Before anyone can answer, the, the tape, TV late news came up. A bulletin just handed to me, said the newscaster, states that our daring jewel robbery was pulled into Chicago at 10 o'clock last night. <sighs> More than $100,000 worth of a cut jets were stolen from the Spiker Jewelry Company. No further details as yet. Whoa, that phone tip of Dad must have been a fake, Joe exploded. I'll bet String wanted to make sure Dad was safely strag tacked on the Long Island before the gang pulled on this job. Frank sprang to his feet. Come on, Joe. We can do some real protective work tonight. To find out what happens to Frank and Joe, and what they do at the mansion, or whatever they're going to do, all you have to do is keep on listening. Chapter 7, coming right up.